Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Today's show is sponsored by Sourcewell. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager, and we have a special guest today. Please welcome to the show the one and only Curtis J. Morley. Curtis, thanks for being on. David, I'm so honored. Thank you so much. Well, Curtis, if, if people don't know about Curtis, he is the author of The Entrepreneur's Paradox. He's director of the Collert Initiative on Technology at the University of Utah. He's started five companies, multi-million dollar companies. His last one had clients, 96 of the Fortune 100. He has been the entrepreneur of the year. He's a patent holder. He's training for Boston's after a big back surgery and, and climbing Kilimanjaro last year. Uh, you're, you're just an interesting guy, but you love your family. You've got five kiddos. You ha have uh, built these companies that have really added value to the world. You just had an exit not too long ago again. And I, I think, you know, you're an example of a trusted leader, both in business and at home and a generous giver in many other ways. You know, I sit on the board of a university. You're doing a lot of service in, in uh, university and in other initiatives. And I'm just so grateful to have you here. So thanks again for being on, Curtis. It's such a pleasure. It's so fun to, to be in contact again. Yes. Well. And I had the honor of endorsing your book. We're going to jump in on that book uh, again. Anything else you would just say, hey, something most people don't know about Curtis J. Morley? Um, a really interesting one is I'm actually allergic to chocolate. Oh. You can believe it or not. Yeah. I'm very <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> just so you're not allergic to all, all ice cream. That's, that's where yeah. we get a problem. No, we can we can do the other ice cream, pistachio, and the raisin rum, and all those. <laughs> there you go. And we're both we're both we've got other similarities, but we're both from small towns and and a whole lot of other things. Let's jump in. I mean, I think there's so much to unpack in in your new book, Entrepreneurs Paradox, and and just your experience in not just you know many people start companies and they fail, but I mean you've actually been successful at this and I, I'm proud of the way you've done so much of it. So I want to jump in on this book and just maybe you could give an overview for everybody, you know, why this book, Entrepreneur's Paradox, and what's the core of it? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, specifically, the, you know, how, how businesses fail. And if you look at the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they, they say that 30% of businesses will go defunct within the first year. And in five years, 50% will be out of business. And I don't believe it at all. I, I know the data is accurate, but I believe they, they've got a faulty assumption. I believe the assumption is that businesses fail. I don't believe businesses fail. I believe entrepreneurs quit. And that is a big reason a big reason why I wrote the book. So why do they quit? I mean, by the way, we, I, I think I have some of my new writing is on, it's not, you know, um, that, that I've been working on is kind of looking at like true contradictions. So like, uh, you know, the early bird gets the worm, but be patient, right? Both can be true, <laughs> right? It, it's like, yeah. and, and I would say, by the way, to the point you're making, there is a another true contradiction or tension, and that is persevere versus pivot. You and I, have, I think, have both seen people persevere, and they've just made it because they persevered. I mean, I can talk about myself 21 years ago, starting in the basement with $1.40 to my name, black mold on the walls and whatever. And yet, we also see people persevere right off the cliff. <laughs> uh, other people, yeah. we yeah. see, you know, pivot too early and they don't make it. Others are seen as brilliant because they pivoted just in time or they would have gone off a cliff, right? So, so what is it that makes them maybe quit or quit at the wrong time? Yeah, and, and I love this, especially this is so timely in our, in our current environment. Our current environment with the pandemic going on, I get asked all the time, is, is it a good idea to start a business in the middle of a pandemic? <laughs> and, and believe it or not, my answer is an emphatic yes. Not just a yes, but an emphatic yes. So why? 
It's because right now we're experiencing unprecedented change globally. We're seeing change that's never been to this extent in the whole world. And the entire planet is doing things differently. And the, the, oppor- the opportunity is there. And, and another name for change is opportunity. So how do I pick the right opportunities? Because obviously change is kind of, it is. You can have good change, you can have bad change, right? But change creates opportunity. So how do I, how do I notice it? And then we got we to come back around to that question of, of you know, what we, we say, you know, what makes us quit? What makes people quit at the wrong time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If I can share an example to illustrate the point. Please. Um, one of my favorite entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, her name is Kylie Chen, and she runs a global expedition company called Echinella Expeditions. She's actually the one that took me to the top of Kilimanjaro, and um, she's amazing. And as you can imagine, if you think of all the industries, all the businesses that were impacted by the pandemic, you know, what was impacted most? Arguably, travel. And Kylie went from a multi-million dollar business to zero in one month, like zero, not, not one customer, not two customer, zero bookings. And, um, and she could have just quit. She could have become one of the statistics that would have been marked at Bureau of Labor Statistics and said, okay, I'm done. I went off the cliff. Whoops. Oh, well, but she didn't. And, and there's a key here is what she did is she said, I'm, I don't believe the need or the demand disappeared. I think it just moved. It moved locations. And, and with the pandemic, you know, travel, you've got to, you know, it got shut off. There was literally only a couple countries that were even letting people in um, out, out of the United States. And so it got cut off. So she said, where did the need go? Where did the need or where did it transition to? And she said, well, People still want adventure. They still want that, you know, that excitement of exploring something new and going to places they've never seen and, and seeing the world in different ways and opening their eyes. And so she said, well, why not provide that domestically? So she created a completely diff- new and different company called Wonder Camp. And it's basically doing expedition of travel within the United States around the national parks. And the amazing thing, David, is that she is now doing as much business domestically as she was internationally. And as soon as the pandemic's over, now she's going to have two multi-million dollar businesses. Mm -hmm. Interesting. When you said something uh, interesting way back, and I guess that that's the single biggest indicator of entrepreneurial success, something specific, you said it in your book, what's the, what is the single biggest indicator of entrepreneurial success? It's an indefatigable drive to um, to never give up. <laughs> hmm. And I know you know that. <laughs> so yeah, so the, we have this drive, but so you, you know, back to something we started with, would you agree that there are some people though that persevere right off the cliff? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So how do we decide Yeah, when to pivot, when to persevere? How do we stay with the right thing at the right time? I mean, this is a big challenge for entrepreneurs. Yeah. I. I believe that any business can succeed with the right business principles applied. And one of those right business principles is making sure you have market fit and market demand. And in Kylie's case, you look at the demand and the demand didn't disappear. The demand was there, but it wasn't there internationally. And so, um, so she said, okay, it's time to pivot. And understanding those business principles, looking at every single quarter, saying, where are we at? Where is the demand? How can we prove that demand? Those are the questions to ask to make sure that you are pivoting at the right place. The, the only constant is change. And, True. and so with that in mind, we need to change with it and just plan on changing. Like there, there's big pivots and then there's business. And business involves small pivots every week, every month, every quarter, every year. It, we're, we're constantly pivoting. We can't be in business without it. How do, we, how do we decide like how much to pivot, when to pivot? How do we have that be a, uh, almost a part of our innovative cycle? 
of thinking, how do, do I need to pivot now? Should I pivot like without it, you know, becoming us and we don't persevere when we ought to. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I actually talked about this, um, in one of the chapters in the entrepreneur's paradox about the example of Thomas Edison and, um, and there's, there's the common held belief that Thomas Edison created the light bulb. Well, the truth is six other people created the light bulb before Thomas Edison. And you look at, at his drive and his singular focus. He was so focused on creating a commercially viable light bulb. And that was the big difference. If you look at the other people, the other inventors, the other business leaders that created other versions of the light bulb before Thomas Edison, they were all well-funded just like him. They were all well-connected. They were all well-educated. They had everything except they didn't push through the hard times. Hmm. They created some, said, hey, everybody, look how cool this is. And then they said, oh, but making it commercially viable, that's going to be tough. And so they gave up. That brings us to another, you know, really good question because you've done this before, you've you've sold companies for millions, you've 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 actually had the experience of really growing companies from startup to growth phase. How do you take it? So many people stay in startup. Let's say all these other six, not not Edison, but these others, they stay in the startup phase. But how do they get to and through this rapid growth phase? How do they have to think differently? How do they have to act differently to? overcome that barrier. You talk about that a little bit in the book. I, I love this question. I absolutely love this question because most entrepreneurs, they, they do hit this invisible ceiling. They hit this glass ceiling and, and there's some inflection points along the way. And each one of those inflection points has its own ceiling. And um, one of the key differentiators from a small business that is hitting that ceiling over and over again, and a business that's experiencing rapid growth um, there, there's a couple of them, but I'll, I'll just hit on a few here. The One of the key differentiators is getting out of the entrepreneur's paradox, getting out of their own way, and, and realizing that the thing that got them into business is actually what will actively prevent them from succeeding in business. How do we do it? How, how do we give it up? Like, oh, but but with our fingerprints on it, you know, it's get, the quality is there and the the touch is there. And that how do we give up, especially when it's not that it's a personal brand, but when it's a, you know, it's 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 we created this, no one else has done it better in a certain way, or given that experience. How do we how do we multiply that? I mean, I see this challenge with so many people in our work, in, in our business, in in businesses like ours that they they just can't grow to scale when they actually they have something that ought to be scalable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and one question that I ask every entrepreneur that I work with is if you're building the product, who's building the business? Think about that. If you're building the product, who's building the business? And that's the paradox is typically people get into business because they're really good at something. They're, and they may be the best in the world at what they do. Um, typically, they are. And I mean, they may have cr- written this incredible dissertation on trust <laughs> and, <laughs> and realize, you know, I've really got something here and people love it. And in my case, you know, I was creating interactive media in my first company and people were like, I've never seen things like this. This is so cool. We, you know, will you do it for me? And you need to start a company. And I'm thinking, well, of course I do. If I know how to create really cool websites, then of course I know how to start a business. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. So what it was the first, did you hire the right number two? Did you hire the right president? What did you do to, if, if you were the expert in building the product, what did you do to build the company that was sellable or scalable? Well, the first few times I... Failed. I made all the mistakes possible. <laughs> I really did. And so what would that, you do differently? That's really why that's why I wrote the book yeah. is because is because I I did make all the mistakes. I made every one of the 16 pitfalls. I just fell face first and and um and then I realized that there's a better way. There's a better way to do this. There's a faster way to do this. There's a way that you can actually get sleep at night. And you don't have to work three hour or three days straight. You know, there, there is a better way. 
And, and it, it took truly the school of hard knocks to teach me these lessons. Hey, it's Anne with the Trust Edge team here. As you know, we are passionate about helping you and your team perform at your best. And that's why David wrote his new book, Trusted Leader. This true to life parable follows the story of a CEO who uncovers the root issue threatening his organization's success. And in the back half of the book, David provides a roadmap for even how to solve those root issues. Get Trusted Leader for your team, your organization, or even just for yourself at trustedleaderbook.com. So let's jump in. People need to get this book, The Entrepreneur's Paradox, but let's jump into what are a few ways we can think of, like right now, let's take an entrepreneur or leader and say, oh, they've got this great thing, but they've kind of hit a ceiling. You know, they haven't been able to scale it, grow beyond themselves. They haven't, you know, what what are things they need to think about doing? What are a, a few of the things from the book that like you hit this mistake? What did they do? What did you do? Yeah, the, the first one is you got to drain the swamp. And um, I, I use an analogy of, of wrestling alligators. So if, you know, we all start businesses and it's usually we're in the real world. We have a day job. We fly over to Entrepreneur Island and we're sitting on the beach, sipping our coconuts and, you know, fishing and pulling in the big fish and building sandcastles. And it's amazing. And we get thrilled. There's just this energy about it. Like, wow, I did something really cool and people actually loved it. And, and let me get let me give the quote here that I pulled out from the book. It's hard to remember to drain the swamp when you're eye to eye with the alligator. Yes. So <laughs> yes. where tell us about this. So when we're sitting there on the island, you know, we think it's this glorious white sand beach with the the beautiful smell of the flowers and the ocean breeze and we're sitting there and all of a sudden an alligator crawls out of the the forest behind us or the jungle and and we're like, "Wait a minute. Wait a minute." This is not what I signed up for. I signed up for the beach and the ocean. And the alligator comes in the form of HR issues, comes in the form of, of legal accounting, comes in the form of all of these things that we didn't expect. We're really good at our trade, whether it's um, teaching people about trust or cool websites or cupcakes or guitar building or international travel, whatever it is, that's what we have a passion and love for. And that's why we started the company in the first place. What we didn't realize is that there were all these alligators. So we wake up every morning, we jump on that alligator, we wrestle it all day long, and we go to bed and the next morning there's another alligator climbing out of the swamp. And the way to, to break free from that cycle and break out of that first glass ceiling is to drain the swamp. And the draining the swamp means creating systems, hiring the right people, taking off all the hats. Because as entrepreneurs, we love to wear all the hats. We, we want to pretend, you know, I may not be a lawyer, but I play one on TV. <laughs> and, you know, all of those things. And when we, when we relinquish that, including being the best in the world at our craft, and that's the hard one. That's the, that's the entrepreneurial reboot of, of the operating system within you know, that's the hardest one is being able to give up. I'm the best in this world at this, but I actually need other people to be the best in the world at what I started the company. That's when the, the entrepreneur breaks out of that glass ceiling. The, the, the next one, one thing you say is decisions done in desperation dictate disaster. And I think of this because I think that's where many are. They're wrestling the eleva- alligator and they're in desperation and they're like, we had this great thing. It's amazing. It's awesome. And, but all of a sudden they can't do it all well and they can't handle the growth. They can't keep up with the growth. Can you give us some, some tips for making those decisions and also for, for really still like, like scaling early on, like getting or or not scaling early on, but, 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 but prepping for rapid growth. Like what are the systems you need? Who are the first hire you hires you'd make? Yeah, absolutely. And the, the first hires are going to be a lawyer and an accountant. And, and when I say hire, it doesn't mean that you bring them on full time. You can you know, get a fractional CFO or you can have a, a lawyer that you, know, you pay for five hours a month or 10 hours a month, whatever it is. But those are going to be some really key ones, especially the accountant. And then um, one that I, I really think is critical is, is hiring an assistant. And especially if you are doing everything all day, you need somebody, you know, one of the alligators that is just 
chronic for entrepreneurs is they love to book their own travel. And you think about that, you know, they'll spend an hour to three hours figuring out just the right flight with just the right hotel. That's three hours you could be working on a multi-million dollar strategy. That's, you know, three hours you could be getting back in your life and you could pay somebody uh, a fairly modest wage to be doing that for you. I remember when someone said to me early on, and I hired probably before I could afford it, but my first hire was the assistant, executive assistant. I remember somebody said to me two things. One, hire it done. If possible, hire it done. If it's not your expertise, hire it done. And the other thing they said, you've got to hire done $10 an hour work so you can do $1,000 an hour work. And it's not like that that's the money, the amount, it's just the, the value. Like what you can do is bring this, but if you're doing $10 an hour work, you can't do the $1,000 an hour work. And that's only really a number of how much value you can give to people when you're using the best of you, right? So I, I agree with that. I actually started, uh, yeah, I, I, we, we have subcontracted, you know, early on lawyers, accounts, those kind of things helped a lot. But I think it's a, another school of thought is uh, Michael Hyatt's where he, he, he wrote a book called um, World Class I think world-class executive assistants. And basically when I read it, he basically built his company to millions and millions of dollars on assistants, like hiring the right assistants. Now at some point you need a CEO or I would think, <laughs> you know, something there. Right. But um, yeah. it's, it's kind of along those lines of try to get out of all these things and only do the thing that you can do right first. Yeah. And then what you're saying is then that thing that you think only you can do train someone else to do that thing. Exactly. Exactly. And, and truly, if you're the entrepreneur, um, you can either be the entrepreneur or the solopreneur. And most, most people, when they hit that glass ceiling, they are the solopreneur. And it's not until they start doing the things that, like taking off the hats. And, and it's funny because people say, well, it's hard to take off the hats. And I say, why? Why is it hard to take off the hats? And you, you hit on something really important. You said, well, nobody does it as good as I do it. Right. <laughs> and, and it really comes down to trust, but it comes down to trust in two ways. The first is that I need to trust someone else that they will own this the way I own it. But the second trust that's important when taking off all the hats is that I need to trust myself. I need to trust myself that I can train someone to do it the way that I want it done, that I need it done, that the company produces. And so it's trusting others, but it's also trusting myself. And when I work with entrepreneurs and um, help them see this, the second one is actually harder mm -hmm. because oftentimes they don't trust themselves to be able to distill that knowledge and that expertise to someone else. That's so true. Wow. Well, there's a lot, there's so much here. People got to get the book, but this is something that stood out also. We're only born with two innate fears. Everything else is learned and can be unlearned. What's yes. that mean? So in 1969, they did a study and they said, what are the fears that we're born with? So they took infants and toddlers and, um, and <laughs> it's not snakes. It's not the dark. It's not any of the things, you know, public speaking. <laughs> you know, it's not any of those things. The two innate fears and the only fears they were able to identify in children was the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. That's it. There were no other fears that were innate when we come down from heaven and, and join this earth, you know, that's it. Those are the only two. And they're, they're actually survival techniques, um, if you think about it. So how do you unlearn them? How do you unlearn fears? Once you've had like a, you could have a, I mean, we, we deal with people, you know, they've had a traumatic experience to put our feet in their shoes. I mean, I can think of the time, you know, I used to even you know, have my lifeguarding uh, certificate to, to lifeguard. And then I got caught underneath of um, something and almost drowned myself. And it made me uh, somewhat um, claustrophobic. In fact, I still feel it at certain times when I get in a certain environment, I can't get out because I was stuck under this water without a way out for quite a long time until I found a, a basically a you know, way across this pool that was covered, uh, a, a way out. And just by seeing a shining light, opening my eyes in that chlorinated water and, and seeing the light come in this one area in a pitch black 
pool and it made me somewhat claustrophobic. I wouldn't mind unlearning that claustrophobia. <laughs> I, it's funny. I, I can totally relate. Um, I thought I was strong enough swimmer to catch my brother off the diving board um, when I was just a little kid and oh boy, was I wrong. So I understand that fear of, of the water and the fear of that claustrophobia. And I don't have a fear of water. I swim, I do triathlons now and whatever, but if it really, what it made is it made a fear of, and I'll can swim across certain lakes now, not, not huge ones, but you know, I mean, I can, but, but it, the, the thing for me now is under anything or tuck tight, anything tight. Uh, like I can't, you know? Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. And yeah, having doing triathlons too. It's it was a learned skill. Swim is still my hardest event, but um, but those fears are valid, and they they come from experience, and they're valid to the point where they they're showing us they're actually a gift that shows us, hey, this is something that you get to overcome. This is a way for you to build who you are, and um, and I talk about in the book the entrepreneur's paradox about. The um, an exercise called fear smashing, and we actually go through. It's a five step process to look your fear in the face and say, "What is it really?" And um, and it goes through this process of identifying fear, looking it in the face, and seeing it for what it really is. And um, and I love I love to say that that fear falters when faced. Fear fear is actually a coward. <laughs> Fear is a serious coward. And when you look it down, when you look it in the eyes and say, hey, fear, I'm actually going to see you for what you are. It turns tail and runs. It is a coward. And um, one real quick, um, this, is, this is also in the book, but one real quick way of getting out of that feeling of anxiety quick in a very short amount of time is um, there's, there's one letter that changes fear into power. And that letter, um, well, I'll, I'll illustrate. The, the phrase that we often hear ourselves in our own brain say is, what if? What if my business fails? What if I work too much and my kids hate me? What if I can't make payroll? What if I ruin these people's lives? What if people think I'm a failure? What if, what if, what if? And I don't know if you can feel it. But as I say those things, I can actually feel my chest constrict, right? I can feel that, oh, that's just a horrible feeling. And if we take off the F and we replace it with an S, so it, instead of what if, now it's what is. And pay attention to how you feel as I say these statements. What is my goal? What is in my power to change? What is my next step? What is my mission here on earth? <laughs> what is the purpose that God wants me to accomplish? Uh, what is? Can you feel the difference in that? Absolutely. This goes along really well with what I, when I was talking to a CEO um, in the middle of the pandemic, and I said, what's working well for you? Because I think he's doing well. He is a client, but uh, he's a, got a significant med tech company. And he said, you know, when he was in the um, in the war college in the 1980s, he learned something, and that was when you have times of uncertainty, you ask, what can I control? Most people, many people that I saw do poorly as far as leaders in the pandemic were thinking, oh, what about the election, this? What about that? What else is the weather going to do? And it doesn't mean we shouldn't be aware of what's happening in the environments, uh, because we have to deal with those as leaders, and we have to foresight and, and all this, but our uh, forecast, but... Most many people spend all the time, all the brain calories on what they couldn't control, and those that paused and thought and spent most of their brain calories on what they could control, they actually found there's a whole lot more than you can control than you think. Right? This goes along with that. What they all these things I can control, and then of those, what should I do first? Very similar to the thought you're 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 talking about around fear here. What what is the way out? What is in my power? What what is my bigger pur purpose or whatever? I love it. Yeah, and, and a dear friend of mine, Richard Vass, he coined the phrase that perplexing on the past produces pain, fretting on the future fuels fear, and only the present produces power and peace. Hmm. And, and it's true. The what is brings us to the present. The what is says, today, right now, this minute, what is 
what is surrounding me with blessings? What is, you know, there's so much in the present that brings that power and that peace that if we let go of the future, we let go of the past and we say, right now, what is my next step? What is in my power to control? If we can get there, we have a chance, right? What's next? Yeah. Hey, it's Sam from the Trust Edge team. Most training and development initiatives don't last or even solve the root issue hindering your organization. That's where Trust Edge Coaching Certification comes in. Trust Edge coaches are equipped with a suite of tools to identify, benchmark, and close gaps in trust for good. Because when you solve the real issue, you get measurable results in a culture where people actually want to make an impact. So whether you're a coach with your own clients, or a leader training people inside your organization, check out TrustEdgeCoaching.com and see how you can start solving the root issue and get lasting results in your business. And now back to the show. So I'm going to jump to some personal things, but before I do, what, uh, what one more little takeaway from the book? There's so much in there for an entrepreneur, but one other thought that you'd like maybe share with us from the book to, to help us, uh, those of us that are entrepreneurs, grow. Yeah, uh, th- this is a hard question because there's so much. There's business acumen, there's leadership, there's, um, there's trust, there's uh, all of these things. Um, one of the things, once the entrepreneur gets out of the paradox, one of the very first things, you know, if you, if you think about wrestling alligators and you think about the swamp, your head is always down. You're always looking for the next alligator. Once you're able to drain the swamp, all of a sudden now you can look up. Now you can look up and you can see that on Entrepreneur Island, there's actually mountain ranges and it's time to start climbing. And so um, one of the very first exercises that I work through with entrepreneurs is picking which mountain range you're going to climb. And and I have what's called the success formula. It's a very different, unique way to create a goal specifically for entrepreneurship. And, um, And with that goal is having people... Um, say, all right, I'm going to pick my mountain range. And this was one of those aha moments so that when I realized this, I'm like, whoa, I, I never even considered this before is there's only three mountain ranges an entrepreneur can climb. There's only three. That's it. There, you know, I always thought, well, there's all these possibilities. No, there's only three. The first is a lifestyle business. The second is a buyer be bought business or, you know, acquisition and merger. And the third is an IPO. That's it. Those are the only mountain ranges that an entrepreneur can climb. And once that realization is there, then there's a starting point. Then there's a way to say, you know what? This is where I want to go. I I just, I really do just want a lifestyle business. Or, you know what? I want to build an amazing rapid growth company that I'm buying other companies. And one day I have an acquisition. Or, you know, I want to get on Wall Street and... And once that's the case, and once we start seeing the goal and working through the success formula, then that's where I see, personally, that's where I see the entrepreneurs, you know, turn their needle from this to this. Love it. Well, there's a lot more in the entrepreneur's paradox. What, what are you learning these days? What do you, what's, the, what, what's new? <laughs> How do you keep innovating and learning these days? You know, um, it's, Wow. I mean, you just sold you just sold your fifth company. You wrote this book. You're definitely consulting and helping people a lot. But what are you learning today? A lot of people say, "What did they, what did someone learn?" I want to know what you're learning today. <laughs> well, it's it's a daily habit. It is a daily habit. Um, on my phone, I have an app that counts things, and and I have daily routines that I go through. And and one of those is is learning. One of those is 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 getting out and understanding things like your podcast. Like, I love your podcast. There's so many amazing guests and so many great insights. And, um, and actually, the last several years have, on a personal basis, have actually been a, really a struggle and very painful. And I sat down with a friend for lunch, and he said something so amazing. He said, Curtis, life doesn't happen to you. Life happens for you. And, and that changed my thinking entirely that life is a blessing. The good things and the trials are all blessings. And that's where I stopped. But then last month, um, David Meltzer put, 
a post up that said, life doesn't happen to you. Life happens through you. And so it took my thinking to a whole new level that life actually does happen for me. It doesn't happen to me. It's not, there's no victim. It happens for me, but it also can, if I let it, it can happen through me. I can become, I can go from victim to victor to vessel. I love it. I can become a vessel. We have a huge opportunity as leaders because we can influence so many others. And those of us that get to give others jobs, what a gift to, you know, in a whole nother way of, of influencing families, people, hopefully the world. But so life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you, but it can happen through you. Yeah. Say that last part, vessel. Yeah. Instead of like, if, if my attitude is that life happens to me, I'm a victim. If my attitude is that life happens for me, all of a sudden I turn into a victor. But if I say life happens through me, now I'm a vessel for something greater than myself. Boom. Mic drop. (laughs) I like it. Let's be vessels. Let's be trusted vessels. That's what I'll say about that because we can be all kinds of vessels. So let's be trusted leaders, trusted vessels. So uh, let, let me touch on just a couple other things here. What, what, uh, what's motivating you these days? You've, you've been through a lot. You've had, you know, I know you've got the training for Boston and some, you know, fun side things, but what's, what's, what's motivating you toward what's next? Um, it, it really is tapping into my purpose on this planet. And, and I've got this huge audacious goal. Um, I want to help a million entrepreneurs reach next level success. I want to help them find the success, not only in their business, but in their personal lives and in their mission, find success. And so that's my goal is to, is to help a million entrepreneurs. And, um, and it happens with the book, with you know, the coaching mentoring, it happens with my students. It's, it's so rewarding to be able to say, wait, 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 I know where you're gonna make this mistake and don't make it. <laughs> I can save you all of this pain, years of pain I can save you. Let me just help you with this one thing. And it, that's, that's what I love is, is just truly helping people to, to find themselves and then find their purpose in their business. Well, for everybody out there, there's a whole lot in here. I, I love this. I was going to ask a few more questions, but we've got a whole lot in here. But let's not be victims. Let's not be victors and sit there. Let's be vessels as trusted leaders. Uh, I've got one more question for you. Before I get to that, though, this has been the Trusted Leader Show. Everybody can go and see the show notes. You're going to find out a whole lot more on Curtis J. Morley. You'll find out You can get his book anywhere, but you'll find out a little bit more about the uh, entrepreneur's paradox and make sure to go pick up the book. And last question, Curtis, who is a leader you trust and why? First thing that came to mind was the the number one leader of all (laughs) um, in the Bible, Christ. Um, The second was um, I I have a, a dear friend. And he's someone that I actually want to be like. Um, his name's Sean Moon, and he's the CEO of Zero Res, um, formerly um, one of the presidents of Franklin Covey. And um, he is he it, he exemplifies trust in so many ways. And um, actually, you know, th- this is not platitudes. You're one of those, David. Hmm. You truly are. Thank there, you. You impacted my life the very first time I met you. You impacted my life deeply. You shared the story about your dad and the magazine and the truck. And that impacted my life severely. That was so, so meaningful to me. And I appreciate how you, you live the principles you teach. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm truly grateful for that. Well, Thank you. Thank you for that. I just had team meeting this morning and, and vulnerably talked about how I wish I would live out what I say even more. So I'm still working on it every day to live out exactly what I believe and uh, continue to, on this journey to, to high trust leadership. But, uh, well, thank you for from all the listeners. Thank you from me and our friendship uh, for being on the show, Curtis. And 
Like we said, you can find everything in the show notes. This has been the Trusted Leader Show. Until next time, stay trusted. <laughs>